That night, Mr. and Mrs. Michaels cheated at Scrabble. He asked for a glass of water, and when she left the room, he flipped through the dictionary, looking for words beginning with the letter Z. In the kitchen, Mrs. Michaels could hear the pages turning, and when she came back, he was counting up his fifty-eight points for Zooid. "'What's that?' she asked, thinking to trap him. But he peered at her as if she were far away, her ignorance barely bridgeable. "'Any organism capable of separate existence, of course,' he said. Mrs. Michaels kept quiet. She didn't even complain when all she could manage was surrounding a vowel already on the board with her own consonants. For rat. "'What's the score?' she asked. And while Mr. Michaels touched the tip of his pencil to the numbered columns, she quickly palmed two of her four A's and returned them to the box, where she chose new letters. Mr. Michaels heard more clicks and scrapes than there should have been, but he kept his head lowered until his wife was done, when he announced, "'You're still ahead!' But at the end of the game, the scores were tied. The first time they could ever remember this happening— each filled with guilty knowledge. They were both grateful, and neither of them had won. "'Well, Mr. Michaels,' she said, this formal name having long ago transformed into tenderness, "'I think that's enough for one night, don't you?' "'Yes, I suppose,' he replied. But she was already walking upstairs, leaving the lights for him. He checked the rooms on the first floor, leaving the kitchen for last. He pressed the refrigerator door to make sure it was closed, and then he looked out of the window at the back yard. He could see in the porch light the yellow-green buds of the trees hovering tentatively, feeling the pull of the branch and the pull of the wind as well. He flicked off the light switch and slowly walked up to the bedroom. Mrs. Michaels heard her husband's careful footsteps. Standing naked in the lamplight, weary of her body, she quickly pulled a nightgown over her head. When he opened the bedroom door, she glanced at him as if she were hiding a secret behind her back. He didn't notice, and rolled up one of her sleeves and tickled her elbow. This is where all your pretty wrinkles began, Mrs. Michaels. All those years of leaning on the table, he said, and then kissed it, for giving her this irrevocable mistake. "'You are always wrinkled,' she whispered in his ear. "'I can't remember a time when you weren't.' And at this fib he led her down to the bed, where they slowly twisted the blankets beneath them. His hands against her back called up a darkened room forty years ago, when the blinds, lit by the lamp outside, had swayed as they both had on the bed. Her knees rocking against his echoed to him an ancient summer, and they had floated on a raft so far from shore no one could have seen what they were doing. But their eyes always opened to the present, to each other's aged faces. Soon she felt a warm release, a small reminder of distant, stronger evenings, the thin breasts brushing against the sheets. She remembered a greeting card he had sent long ago, how its pale printed flowers had only hinted at his darker passion. "'Oh, Mr. Michaels!' she cried. "'Oh, Mr. Michaels!' Later, she listened to him breathing quietly beside her, the room around them absolutely black, and she imagined she was lying in a field. Above her, clouds shaped like words passed by, a long white list of first names. Her husband's was somewhere among them, and she waited for its approach. But the sky grew darker, and she fell asleep. When Mr. Michaels died in the early morning, he floated up through the bedsheets to the ceiling, then slowly into the attic, the old suitcases and rolled up rugs barely visible in the dark. Finally his eyes reached the roof, and the shingles receded as he quickly drifted up in the air. But the long view of the surrounding town and the distant horizon, the sun still hidden, made him dizzy. There wasn't any place he wanted to be but home, so he imagined his feet were weighted, each toe fat, each foot heavy. He slowly fell and thought of where he wanted his feet to take him, 
to the kitchen for the breakfast smell of butter melting into toast, then to the living room to feel the serrated edges of the rare domestic issues of his stamp collection. As he thought of the thick lenses of his glasses on the night table, his feet slipped through the bedroom ceiling, his entire form descending in the air to the carpeted floor. There he stared at his still body and waited for his wife to wake up. It wasn't until she opened her eyes that he realised what she saw, his quiet figure, his absence of breath easily discovered as she placed a palm against his nostrils. Then she slowly moved her hand down to his chest and held it there for a very long time, her face pressed against his shoulders. Only when she sat up could he see her smeared and silent tears. Mrs. Michaels closed her eyes. She didn't want to see the room or anything in it. She groped for the door to the hallway, and even if her eyes had been open, she wouldn't have seen her husband hovering and arms wide to embrace her as she passed through him. At the stairs she stopped and looked down at the light slanting through the living room curtains. This is an ordinary day, she said aloud. The sun is up. Nothing has happened. But when she looked back past the bedroom doorway, her husband's motionless figure silently refuted her. His body was soon carried from the house by strangers and driven off. Mr. Michael stood by the window, the sunlight passing through him as he watched the vanishing car. He waved goodbye and his hand passed through the glass pane near where a fly was resting. He pulled his hand back inside and trapped it easily. But the fly continued rubbing its thin legs together, unaware of his enveloping, visible hand. It flew through his fingers to a lampshade. He followed and captured it, and again it escaped in contented and unpredictable flight. While he chased the fly about the house with an anger and frustration that almost convinced him he was alive, his wife remained upstairs, silent before the unmade bed. The phone rang through the day interrupted by Mrs. Michael's long and sad conversations. The children began to arrive, the only son, the three daughters. Unseen, Mr. Michaels examined them closely. They looked old, and he felt that he was a child and they were his parents. He couldn't bear this, but when he closed his eyes he saw right through his transparent lids. He quickly guided away to the laundry room, the quietest part of the house and slid through the curved metal door of the hamper, and hid. He settled among the soiled clothes, and listened to the murmur of familiar voices that pulled at him like fingers. When the house was empty, the family far away at his wake, and then funeral, he came out to practice his new existence, and sat for hours in the winged chair, balancing his elbows so they wouldn't sink down into the upholstered arms. After the funeral, everyone returned to the house for a farewell lunch. The large families of his children crowded the rooms and mingled with the neighbours and friends. No one was aware of him. He listened but soon grew depressed because he couldn't recognise himself in their stories. He didn't remember any roller coaster ride or repairing a bicycle. He wandered off and found himself following his great grandchildren two boys, who were walking uncertainly away from the adults. He stared at their strange tiny faces, but he still couldn't recall their names. They babbled in an almost English that they seemed to understand as they circled each other. One tottered, and off balance, grabbed the other, and they both fell. Mr. Michaels fell too, in sympathy, but at their cries the boys were swept up by their mothers, and he sat alone. He stayed there and watched his wife. She insisted on organising everything, the sandwiches, the passing of cold beer, the request for coffee. Only when she paused did he see the frantic look in her eyes. He returned to the hamper and stared for hours at a sock curled in on itself. Mrs. Michaels overlooked the slow departure of friends and family. Sally, her oldest daughter, offered to stay a few days, but was thanked and refused. 
Sally herself was a grandmother, and she looked so old Mrs. Michaels couldn't wait for her to leave. When she was finally alone, she closed the curtains and hid her own reflection. Then she walked to the laundry room. She stood before the hamper and opened it. Out spilled the clothes, and her husband, though she didn't see his confused, invisible tumbling. Instead, she separated his clothes from hers, determined not to wash them and erase his smell, his stains. She carried them to the bedroom and hung his shirt and pants in the closet, folded and settled his underwear and socks in the dresser. When she closed the doors, she felt that somehow she was holding him inside. Mr. Michaels quickly discovered death has no sleep, and day and night became for him a turning of light and dark. At night, while his wife slept alone, he sat awake in a chair downstairs. He missed dreams and invented his own from the sounds outside. When he heard the hiss of a car passing in the street, he became its driver, chased by something swift and unseen. In the summer heat, the moths tapping against the windows were the footsteps of someone whose arrival he constantly awaited. During the day, he wandered in the house, trying to avoid his wife, for though he was the ghost, her sorrow was haunting him. She read paragraphs aloud from the newspaper, and then stopped, embarrassed at the sight of his empty chair. All the while he was pacing across the room, but he'd given up responding. At these moments he felt a tug at his shoulders, as if he were connected to strings. He realised he belonged somewhere else, and he'd only to let himself float up, and he would find it. But something always held him back. One evening Mrs. Michael set the table for two, as she prepared dinner, minute steaks, rice boiled in chicken broth, buttered broccoli but no one arrived for the meal by the time she filled the plates and sat alone to eat. Mr. Michaels hesitated at first, then he sat down at his place. He pretended he could lift a knife and fork and picked at his untouched portions. Beyond hunger, he watched her. A pressure to rise pulled at his shoulders. It's time to leave, he thought, and his feet rose. Mrs. Michael's sorrow suddenly seized her, and she pushed back from the table and leapt up. She quickly left the kitchen and searched in the rooms for her dead husband, as if it were all a trick and he was only hiding. She peered into the closets, the hangers screeching against the metal poles as she pushed them aside. She bent down to stare at the cool dark under the beds. She didn't know he was behind her, drawn by her search, his shoulders no longer tingling. He hoped he could be found, that somehow they both would find him in a corner with dust on his fingers and a slight smile on his ashamed face. But finally, in the basement, coming out from a pile of deserted furniture, she said to no one, He's dead. Though he was still poking about in a warped armoire, he silently agreed. Because she knew he wasn't there, Mrs. Michaels could see her husband more clearly in the space he had abandoned, and she no longer called to or searched for him. Instead, she noticed his absence beside her in the morning, the blanket smooth on his side of the bed. She remembered how he would pretend to be still asleep so she could wash up before him, and she rose with pleasure and walked to the bathroom. Next to her hovered Mr. Michaels, who unable to know her thoughts, saw only her satisfaction, and felt more than invisible, forgotten. He watched her morning ritual for the first time, as she washed her face and pressed soapy fingers into the wrinkles with determination, as she combed her thin grey hair carefully, the curls twisting as they slipped through the dark plastic teeth. A strand fell to the floor, and Mr. Michaels wished he could catch it, but it was yet another small private moment of his wife's that had passed him invisibly all his life, and that now, in death, couldn't be held. And when she began to pull up her nightgown to sit on the toilet, he had to look away. After dressing, Mrs. Michaels walked downstairs, remembering her husband by the lack of his morning cough, by not hearing humming while he opened and closed the drawers and closet door.
In the kitchen, she filled the cereal bowl with flakes of bran, poking among them and counting the number of raisins. Her unhappy husband counted along with her, amazed at the deafness of her fingers, yet lonely as she poured the milk into the bowl, and smiled at his empty place. When his wife left to go to the market, Mr. Michaels called to the closing door, "'Please come back!' But she didn't hear. He was afraid to follow, certain that he'd float away in the wind outside, and when she returned he attended her movements even more closely. In the evening, as Mrs. Michaels sat in the tub's cloudy water and carefully untangled the hair under her arms after sponging off the soap, she felt a chill of wind on her back, while her husband attempted to knead her stiff shoulders with his invisible fingers. One night in bed, Mrs. Michael's hands began to travel, palms lingering at the rise of hips. Her fingers probed tentatively to a distant past. Eyes closed, she saw her husband much younger, his hair still thick and dark. Mr. Michaels, hovering in bed beside her, watched her hands moving with grace, and he couldn't turn away and grant her this private act. Instead, he floated over and drifted gently down upon her. He tried to move his airy body in the ways he thought she was imagining, while her hands called up memories of his elbows by her arms, his lips at her forehead. When her body finally shook and settled, he remained over her, a transparent blanket in the dark. Then she pulled up the covers and he curled into the folds. He could hear the leaves falling in the wind outside, and he imagined they were words he whispered to his wife, to which she responded by half-turning her thin legs against him. In her unsettled sleep she dreamt she was a child chasing something she couldn't see, growing older with every stride she took. Yet for him, always awake, the darkness was now a kind of sleep, her rustlings under the blanket, a kind of dream. He rose in the middle of the night and glided to the window, where the furious whistling of the wind surged against the glass. He watched the brown twisting leaves scuttle over the black lawn. When his wife rose from the bed, drawn as well to the wind, he imagined that she knew he was beside the window. Slowly, awkwardly at first, she hummed along with the insistent and muted flourishes outside, and he joined her trying with his transparent voice to harmonize. In their own ways, they followed the turns of an ancient music. Mrs. Michaels in her white nightgown, accompanied by her lover, her invisible husband. <laughs>